Welcome to America's Test Kitchen at Home. Today, we're cooking breakfast. I'm gonna show you how to fry the perfect egg. Erin's gonna to talk to us all about cold brew coffee. Adam has a roundup of tools for eggs. And last but not least, Elle's gonna show us how to make yeasted waffles. We've got a lot in store today, so stick around. There are three recipes that I think every home cook should know how to make. First up, the perfect roast chicken. Second, a killer vinaigrette. You can put on anything from salad to grilled vegetables to meats. And last but not least, a perfect fried egg. One that has crisp edges, tastes a little buttery. The whites are fully cooked through, but that yolk is still a little runny, which is what I'm gonna show you how to make today. Okay, now first up, let's talk about the pan. We're gonna use a 12 inch nonstick skillet because I'm making four eggs, so you want a lot of surface area. Non-stick for the obvious reason that you want the eggs to come out of the pan without breaking the yolk. Also, I have two teaspoons of veg oil. This pan is heating up over low heat and you wanna let it preheat for five minutes. That way, there's no hot spots in the pan so the eggs will cook evenly. All right, so while that's heating up, let's talk about the eggs. I'm gonna use four large eggs and you don't wanna crack them one at a time into a hot pan because the cooking time on these eggs is really short, about a minute. So if you crack them one at a time, they're all gonna be at various stages of doneness. So you wanna crack them into two bowls so you can add them at once. No magic here, just cracking, except you don't wanna break any yolks because in my world, a broken yolk means you have a rough day ahead. So take your time. All right. Now we're just gonna season with a little salt and pepper. And if you want to, this is when you can jazz it up a bit. You wanna add a little cayenne, a little smoked paprika, a little chili powder, or a little Syrian pepper. If you've ever had that on eggs, it's good stuff. All right, so the eggs are ready. And now this skillet has been heating up for five minutes. I'm gonna turn the heat up to medium high and I'm gonna look for this oil to start to shimmer. That's gonna let me know that the skillet is hot enough to fry the eggs and get those crisp edges. So while that is heating up, I'm gonna get some butter that I've been keeping cold in the fridge. The oil is starting to shimmer. Now I'm gonna slice off just a little bit of butter, about two teaspoons, a little less than a tablespoon. Again, this butter is nice and cold. Cutting it into small pieces, we're gonna add it to the skillet. Yep, that little bit of sizzle is perfect. Now the butter just adds flavor. We're gonna swirl the skillet around, get that butter to melt nice and quickly. Mm. Oh, perfect. All right, now in go the eggs. And as soon as the eggs go in, I'm gonna put the lid on. Cooking the eggs under the lid is the other thing that most people skip, but it's really important because you wanna trap the steam and that'll help cook the egg whites that are sitting on top. And the timer gets started for one minute. Okay, here I have some plates all ready to go with some nice oven cooked bacon. If you don't cook your bacon in the oven, you are missing out because it cooks through perfectly. And my favorite whole grain toast, some coffee and orange juice. You can find that bacon recipe, by the way, on our website, americastestkitchen.com. All right, that's been a minute. And now, last but not least, the key to perfectly cooked eggs is to slide the skillet off the heat to let them finish cooking. That way you won't overcook the yolk. Now you're gonna let this sit off the heat anywhere from 15 seconds up to a minute or more, depending on how you like your yolks. Now I like my yolks on the runny side, so I'm usually around 15, 20 seconds. Okay, now look at these eggs. The top of the yolks, that albumin, that egg white, has just clouded over, but you can see the yolks are still runny. All right, I'm gonna cut this in half. Here we go, we're gonna slide ooh, on one plate. Oh, time to dig in while they're good and hot. I love doing it with a piece of toast. Best bite of the day right here. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. You break in, oh, look at that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Good morning. Now I'll use the fork. <laughs> this part, this fried edge, it's like diner style eggs, right? I dip it a little in the yolk. Oh yeah. Let the day begin. So if you wanna make perfect fried eggs, Remember to heat that skillet up first for five minutes. Next, you wanna make sure you cover that skillet while you're cooking the eggs, and last but not least, slide that skillet off the heat to finish cooking the eggs. From America's Test Kitchen at Home, perfect fried eggs.
I started drinking iced cold brew coffee about 10 years ago. And since then, I drink it pretty much regularly, especially during the warm weather months. I love iced cold brew coffee because it's a lot smoother and less bitter than regular iced coffee, which I also love. But I also started making iced cold brew coffee concentrate at home, and I'm gonna show you how to make that. And it all comes down to the beans. So we're gonna start with medium roast coffee beans. And it's important to use medium roast coffee beans because you can really taste the true flavors of the coffee bean. It's also very important to grind your own coffee beans right before you make your concentrate so that it's fresh. I'm gonna start by weighing out seven ounces of the medium roast coffee beans. If you don't have a scale, all you have to do is measure out two and a half cups. All right. So now that we have our beans, now we're gonna grind them. So you have two different grinding options. You have a blade grinder and you have a burr grinder. A blade grinder is designed where it has one hopper and inside of it, it has a blade. It's just like a little mini food processor. And what you do is you put your coffee beans in there, put the lid on it and you press the button and the blade just really chops up those coffee beans. And you have to shake it a couple times and it does generate heat and it does take away a little bit of the flavor of the coffee. So a more gentle approach is using a burr grinder. So a burr grinder has three different parts to it. It has a hopper where you put your beans into, and then inside it has a chamber where it grinds up the coffee beans as the coffee beans go through it. It's kind of like how a pepper grinder works. And then as it grinds, it falls right into this little uh, removable container. So I have it set at coarse. When it comes to ice cold brew coffee, we want coarse. All I'm gonna do is pour the coffee beans right into the hopper. Before I start to grind my coffee beans, as I've made this over the years, I've discovered that static is created as it grinds. So when you open up the chamber, little coffee bits go flying everywhere. So I found a little trick to avoid that from happening. And that's basically taking a paper towel, dipping it into water, and then just dripping maybe about 10 drops of water over it. And then I stir that in with the base of a spoon. And what this does is the water really just kind of keeps the beans from flying around. I used to make a mess every time I made this until I figured out how to fix it. All right, so now you put the lid on and we're ready to grind. Okay, if there's static, we're gonna find out. And there's no static, so it's just perfect thing. It's a game changer. Okay, so here's our French press. And I'm just gonna add this coffee into the French press and grind the rest of the coffee beans. I wish you could smell this right now. The smell of fresh ground coffee, it just wakes you right up. Okay, so that's our coffee. It's waiting for us under French press. So let's go on to our second ingredient, which is water. So when making cold brew concentrate, it's really important that you use good filtered water and that will allow the true flavors of the coffee bean to come through. You can taste all the little nuances and the caramel notes and the coffee notes and the chocolate notes. So we want two and a half cups of water. What this comes down to is basically a ratio of one to one. So one part coffee to one part water. We're using two and a half cups of coffee. We're using two and a half cups of water. I'm gonna pour this water over the coffee grinds. If you have a larger French press, by all means, just increase the, the ratio accordingly. You can see it, all the coffee is kind of rising to the top. And so I'm gonna use a chopstick. And what this chopstick is gonna do, it's a very gentle method for stirring the water and the coffee together. So now I'm kind of making a ground coffee slurry. And it's really important that all the coffee grinds come in contact with water. All the flavors are gonna come out of the coffee and into the water, which is what we want. And so I'm feeling pretty good about this. It's definitely loosened up, but just to be sure, I'm gonna let this sit for 10 minutes and I'm gonna come back and stir it one more time. Okay, so it's been about 10 minutes. And as you can see, a raft has formed. The coffee grinds have slowly risen and the water has settled. And so now I just wanna make sure that I give it one more stir. It's very important that the coffee grinds have full contact with the water. So I'm breaking up the raft and giving it another stir I should mention that there's a lot of recipes out there that call for constant agitation, stirring it often. It's really not necessary. This is it. This is all that you have to do is just stir it this one last time. And now I'm gonna cover it with plastic wrap. And this is where it's gonna do its thing. 
It takes a little bit of time, but it's all hands off. So I'm gonna let this sit for about 24 hours and you can let it sit from anywhere between 12 hours and 72 hours, whatever works best for you and your schedule. But I found that the 24 hour mark is the perfect mark for the extraction that I like. So I'm just gonna let this sit for 24 hours and we'll come back. It's been 24 hours and our coffee has steeped and it's ready to press. So I'm gonna remove the plastic wrap. It's good to give it a little quick, gentle stir, and that will help the raft to kind of break up again and the pressing will be a little bit easier. So now I'm gonna take my plunger and I'm gonna start pressing. This does take a little bit of muscle. You don't wanna put a ton of muscle into it because remember you are pressing on a glass jar and you don't want it to break, which has happened. Okay, so now it's ready to strain. So over here, I have a fine mesh strainer and I put a coffee filter in it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour the coffee that I've pressed and I'm just gonna drain again through the coffee filter. And this step really is not 100% necessary, but what it does is it removes any extra kind of coffee sludge that I really don't want in my coffee. Um, some people like it, I don't really care for it, so I'm gonna strain it out. Ah, uh, smells delicious. All right, smells amazing, I'm getting excited. Um, okay, so while that's starting to drain, I'm just gonna um, slide this over here. There's another step. So I have a large bowl and I have a triple layer of cheesecloth that I've lined it with. I wanna get every drop out of the coffee grinds that are still in this coffee press. So I'm just gonna transfer them to this setup, scrape them in. This is gold. Ah. I gather all the corners together make a little little pouch so I'm just gonna give it a couple of squeezes and now I'm just gonna pour this right into the coffee filter as well okay so now we're just gonna let this sit and it takes about a couple of hours for all that coffee to go through the filter and you can take a rubber spatula and help kind of move any silt and any sludge that is left behind so that the coffee can flow through a little bit faster It's been a couple of hours and our coffee has fully gone through the filter. So as you can see, it's really strained out quite a bit of coffee grit. So I'm just gonna put this aside and now we're ready to basically put this into a jar and refrigerate it. It keeps for about one week. What I like to do at this point is put it into individual servings. So I have a couple of jars. So I take my concentrate and I'm just gonna divide it up. A half a cup of concentrate is a full portion. This makes two portions. Now it's ready to put into the refrigerator and I have my individual portions ready to go. My cold brew has chilled and it is showtime. I have a half a cup of concentrate. Now I have cold filtered water. So I'm gonna measure out a half a cup. Again, you want to use really good water when you're making your cold brew. So you really want those coffee flavors to come through. The ratio here is one to one, but if you like your cold brew stronger, you can use a little less water. If you like it a little bit weaker, you can use a little bit more water. So I like it at one to one ratio. So I'm gonna pour that into my cold brew. And this is kosher salt. I'm gonna add just a little pinch and what this does is the salt really kind of rounds out the flavors of the coffee and it also tames down any remaining bitterness that might be left over. So I'm just gonna swish that around to let that salt dissolve a little bit. Okay, so now it's ready to pour over my ice, but I wanna point out that I actually made my own ice cubes from filtered water. You start with filtered water, you should really have clean ice cubes as well. So all you do is just pour this right over those ice cubes. And when I drink cold brew, I like to add almond milk to it. So I'm gonna foam some. I don't do this all the time, but it really does make it a little extra special. The head of the foamer, you want to be at the bottom of the liquid. And then as it becomes greater in volume, you can slowly lift up the tip of the foamer, just so it's just under the surface of the foam. So this milk foamer is really kind of fun gadget to have. I use it when making lattes or cappuccinos. You can foam milk or you can foam almond milk. All right, so now all you do is just hold a little foam back. I pour almond milk in. Look at that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful foam. All right, my ice cold brew is ready to drink. You can really taste the coffee. 
I'm getting like little chocolate bits and roasted coffee, but it's not too roasted, it's not too strong, it really doesn't dominate. And making the foam is really nice because you can actually taste the foam as it's sitting on top. You can also really um, enjoy it as it's mixed into the cold brew as well. But this is well worth every step that I've taken. The payoff is having a couple bottles in your fridge at all times so that you have this to pour and make yourself and it's a nice treat. If you wanna make the best ice cold brew concentrate, remember to use medium roast coffee that's coarsely ground, filtered water, and a one-to-one -one ratio of coffee to water. So from America's Test Kitchen at home, a spectacular recipe for cold brew coffee concentrate. It's such a treat. Eggs serve more culinary purposes than I could possibly rattle off. But around here, the most important one is they're the basis of all kinds of simple, satisfying meals that I would eat morning, noon, and night. Here are a couple of our favorite tools that you need to achieve excellence. First, let's start with a nonstick skillet. That's the right choice for making omelets or fried eggs. We've tested them all, and the one that we like the best is the OXO Good Grips Nonstick Pro Open 12 Inch Fry Pan. It's about $42. It's got a good slick cooking surface. It's broad also at nine and three quarter inches, and the pan is light and easy to maneuver. It also comes in a 10 inch size and an eight inch size. Now, if you're gonna follow the ATK recipe for fried eggs, you'll need to cover the pan. And most of these nonstick skillets don't come with a cover. We've tested all of the universal covers out there. Weren't really impressed with any of them, except for one. It's not strictly speaking a universal cover, but this one is the $36 Lodge Tempered Glass 12 inch cover. It seals really well to our favorite 12 inch skillet and it's definitely the cover to get. Even if you have the cover and the right skillet, it's super easy to overcook eggs. So timing them carefully is paramount. And for that, obviously you'll need a timer. Our favorite timer is this one. It's the OXO Good Grips Triple Timer. It's about $20 and it's got lots to recommend it. There are three timers, which you can read simultaneously so that you can monitor three different projects at once. It's got a clock, it's got a stopwatch, it keeps track of elapsed time, and our favorite feature is the direct entry keypad. So you can type whatever time you want right in there without all kinds of irritating scrolling. You really cannot exaggerate the need for the right equipment when you're cooking eggs. If y'all know anything about me, you know I love a make-ahead moment. So the idea of having a waffle recipe in the fridge waiting for me Saturday morning is kind of exciting. Let me show you how I do it. I start with one and three quarter cup of low fat milk. And to that, I'm gonna add eight tablespoons of butter, a whole stick, so you know it's gonna be good. I'm gonna turn this on to a medium low heat about three to five minutes. All right, it's been about five minutes. The butter has melted. This is exactly what we were looking for. I'm gonna go over to the table and start mixing our dry ingredients while I let this buttermilk cool until it's warm to touch. In the meantime, I'm gonna start to make our dry mix. I'm gonna start with 10 ounces of flour. Perfect. To the flour, I'm gonna add a tablespoon of sugar. Also, one and a half teaspoons of yeast. And finally, one teaspoon of salt. And I'm gonna whisk together these dry ingredients until they're well combined. So the yeast here plays two roles. It provides leavening and it adds great flavor. All right, I'm gonna set this mixture to the side. I'm also gonna test my milk to see if it's warm to touch. Still a little hot. So I'm gonna start with the eggs. And we have two large eggs. And I'm gonna add a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Now I'm just gonna whisk the vanilla and the eggs until they're well combined. All right, that looks great. Before I put this in, I have to add the milk and butter and make sure it's ready, warm to touch. Perfect. So I'm gonna slowly whisk this in. So the warm milk jump-starts the yeast. 
All right, so I'm just gonna mix it well. I'm using my whisk to scrape any flour from around the edges of the bowl. All right, and now I'm gonna add our egg vanilla mixture. And I'm just gonna whisk it until it's well combined. I'm just gonna use my spatula to scrape down the edges to make sure that all of the batter is mixed well. So the warm milk jump started the yeast, but now we need to slow it down by putting it in the refrigerator or else we'll have a sour tangy batter and no one wants that. I'm gonna cover it with plastic and put it in the fridge for 12 to 24 hours. It's been 12 hours and our batter is ready. And you can tell that it's ready because it's foamy and it has doubled in size. I'm just gonna use the whisk to kind of reconstitute it. So it will deflate once you start to whisk it, but that's perfectly normal. So I have my waffle maker preheated. I'm gonna spray it with some cooking spray, top and bottom. So I'm gonna put about a cup of batter into the waffle maker. And this cool dude makes two waffles, so I'm saving some time. So to go with my very special waffles, I have a very special guest for brunch today. My mom, Dr. Price. Hi. 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 I made waffles. I'm excited. You know I it's love your favorite. waffles. It's your it's favorite. It's my absolute favorite. All right, so these waffles are done. Oh my. And they're mm. nice and golden. Oh, they smell so good. All right. A lot of butter for you. Lots of I know butter. you like a lot of butter yes. on your mm. waffle. That looks good. Is that good? A little syrup. Oh, <laughs> it goes right <laughs> into the little. Crack. You get so excited over the little things. I do, I do. This is good. Do you want peaches, mama? I want everything heavy on the goodness. Thank you. Mm. All right. Ah, okay. let's dig in. Let's I'm get so started. excited. Yes. Mm. 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 Oh, that's mm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Did you almost rub your belly? I did. I did. I caught myself. <laughs> <laughs> this is so good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have a little tune. If you're not dancing and singing, Humming. right, it's not right. good. It's the number one sign that it's delicious. Okay, I need to finish this up. You can enjoy. Okay. So if you want to make special waffles for your special mom, just remember these key steps. Kick start it with warm milk and rest it in the fridge overnight. So from America's Test Kitchen at home, crispy, fluffy, yeasted waffles. Thanks for watching. You can get all of the recipes from this season, along with our product reviews and more at our website, americastestkitchen.com slash TV. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later. <laughs>